Okay, so, so first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me here to come and give my talk. And my talk today is going to be much more focused on functional morphology. Um, Martine mentioned a lot of the work that I've done on in biogeography and fossils, but this, the talk that I'm going to present today is, is really going to focus on functional morphology and the, the approach that I've taken to study morphology. And so I'm going to start this talk um, by, by mentioning some recent advances in molecular sequencing that for me has given me the ability to now begin to study, to, to use this, these advances to study trait evolution. And so I'm gonna go over that a little bit at the beginning, and then I'm gonna to start to talk about my, my own research in functional morphology. And let's see if I can advance my slide. Here we go, okay. So it was just a few years ago that this paper by Starrett et al. Um, came out that showed a very accessible way that we can use this new method of target enrichment and target capture to understand phylogenetic relationships in arachnids. And they did this um, following this, the, this using these, the methods of ultra conserved elements or UCEs, which is a really, a, a very accessible way to allow you to sequence hundreds of loci. Um, there is an arachnid probe set for doing this and you, you do this following this Filucci pipeline. Um, the most important part for me about this method, the sequencing method, is that it requires DNA to be fragmented. And so this is something that conveniently has already been done for us uh, in museum collections around the world where we have arachnids sitting at room temperature in 75% ethanol. And so these methods make use of fragmented DNA um, and and because of this, we can use uh, material that is stored in collections. And so um, since that paper, there's just been a flurry of papers that have come out uh, using these methods. Um, the, these methods have been crucial for understanding relationships in my gallimorphs, for looking at deep relationships uh, in palpamenoid spiders, which is um, my, my own, the group that I work on. And for palpamenoids, I've been able to use, um, again, material stored in collections because these spiders occur in many remote parts of the world. So I didn't have to go out and recollect a lot of these spiders, but I've been able to use uh, material from collections. They've been crucial in understanding um, trait evolution and um, relationships among early diverging Iraniomorph spiders. Um, Shahan durkar Betian has looked, has, has shown us how, you know, in more depth, how we can use museum specimens to, uh, with these methods. He's gone, been, been able to sequence um, specimens that are over 100 years old. And um, working with Siddharth Kulkarni um, and others, we've we've even gone, uh, we've designed a new probe set that works on uh, for that's a spider specific probe set, uh, allowing you to sequence even uh, double the amount of, of loci, that double the amount of loci from using the arachnid probe set. So this is just a small sample of some of the papers that have been coming out recently that are really revolutionizing uh, arachnid systematics. And so there are many benefits to this, um, this type of sequencing. For one, it, it's very fast and the cost is reasonable compared to Sanger sequencing. And especially when you consider the huge amount of data that you end up getting, um, you, it, it's, it's a very fast method. It allows you to look at phylogenetic relationships, not only at, at both shallow and deep levels using the same, the same probe set, which is something that we couldn't do before with Sanger sequencing. I found these methods to be much more straightforward in terms of sequencing and in terms of analysis compared to Sanger sequencing. You, you have such a huge amount of data there. There's a lot, I found there it's, there's a lot less tweaking. And, um, 
and also it seems that these next generation data sets can be combined. So this picture, this picture on the, the right is from a recent study by Siddharth Kulkarni and um, where he combined data, the data sets derived from UCE sequencing with, um, with transcriptomes. And he was able to produce this very large, comprehensive, robust phylogeny of spiders. And so we are finally at a place where we can understand phylogenetic, where we're beginning to understand phylogenetic relationships across arachnids. And we can sort of, that we can grasp um, that, that there's the possibility at least to do this quickly. And uh, we can generate these phylogenies uh, relatively easily. Now, as a grad student, uh, about 10 years ago, I was working on the tree of life project for spiders. And this, the idea that we could do this at the time just seemed impossible. Um, there was a sense that arachnology was so far behind in terms of sequencing and that we would never catch up. So it's important to acknowledge how far we've come in just the last few years. And so the big question though is, is what's next and how can we use these methods to not only advance the field of, uh, of, of classification and systematics of arachnids, but how can we use these methods to understand arachnid biology and natural history? And so for me, what I've been inspired to do is to return to the traits that initially got me interested in arachnology in the first place. Um, and and I was inspired, you know, when I first started in arachnology, I was very inspired by the shapes and the diversity and just the bizarre natural history of arachnids. Um, I asked, so these pictures that you see here come from, uh, are from Gustavo de Miranda and Bob Kalal, which are two postdocs working with me at the Smithsonian. And they've, um, I think these pictures really capture the love and the curiosity that we all feel for our organisms um, that, that we work on. And so many of us come to the field with this love of morphology and many of us are trained in morphology and morphology is a really tangible way to study arachnid biology. But I wanna know how we can really advance our study of morphology to make it more meaningful. And so with the advent of these molecular sequencing methods, morphology is now typically used to study trait evolution once you have your phylogeny. So you build your phylogeny with sequencing. This is what's typically done now. And then you map on your morphological characters. Um, and in some ways, this feels like there's a loss to to morphology, but at the in, in the other hand, and a more positive way to think about this is that molecular sequencing has now given us the opportunity to really focus on morphology and use it to understand um, evolutionary patterns. And so we we do this. We we so now we study morphology using these phylogenetic comparative methods. Um, so, for example, um, this this is an ancestral character state reconstruction that I did um, when I was a master's student. And you can make these nice figures like the one shown here where you can document the morphological diversity that we see um, and show and also you can look at convergence and how these traits are evolving. So at the point of, of this study here, I, I wanted to um, point out that neck length in archaeids, this is on archaeid spiders, these are from Madagascar, how it's evolving in, in parallel. So you're getting long necks that are evolving multiple times or being lost. Um, and to really show the diversity of this morphology. But there's something to me that is a little bit unsatisfying about these methods, which is that it's still, while I'm documenting the diversity, it's still leaves the question of why did this happen? What's the biology behind these unusual traits? Um, and it leaves a lot to still be, a lot that is still unknown. And so in another study, um, as part of another paper, I tested for correlations between this trait of neck length with habitat. Um, 
and this was done using phylogenetic generalized least squares, which is similar to Felsenstein's independent contrast. And what I found was statistical support that, um, that these, the long neck species occur more up in the vegetation and the short neck species occur more often down on the ground. And I use this to argue that this trait is adaptive and it allows these spiders to coexist and occupy different niches. But again, there was still something very unsatisfying about this method because it didn't really solve my original curiosity of understanding how and why this trait was being used, this long neck trait in these spiders. And so I can guess that maybe it's likely that the long neck species in the vegetation were targeting a different composition of prey, but it could be for other reasons as well. And so there are limitations to these phylogenetic comparative methods, and particularly so when we're just focused when we just focus on morphology. And so in the first case with the ancestor character state reconstruction, again, we're documenting diversity, but it's, it's sort of, it's unsatisfying. And these, even these correlations were unsatisfying to me because they didn't really get at what my curiosity was, which is directly testing what morphology is used for. And I think the biggest limitation of these methods, um, particularly ones where we're focused on morphology is that we're making this assumption this, that, this, that morphology um, is somehow, this, that this morphology is important and that it can serve as a proxy for function. And this, this, is, a, um, this is behind the concept of ecomorphs where you know, we look at these different morphologies and say these morphol they must be doing something different in their environment. And this is very likely to be true but we never really directly test this. Um, and so it's problematic because it may in fact be that there are many different ways to produce morphologically to produce the same function or performance. And the classic example of this is this four bar linkage system in fish jaws where there are many different morphologies in the jaws of fish but it turns out that these many, this myriad of morphologies can produce, can produce the same function, which in this case uh, is suction. So it's a very different thing for morphological diversity to arise as a result of many different morphological solutions that are converging on the same function compared to the scenario where morphological diversity arises due to just an endless, an endless amount of different functions and performance values. And so what's the solution? Well, um, for me, what, what, I've, what I've tried to do is I've tried to shift my research from just documenting morphology and uh, to, to instead document, looking in a comparative context to start um, directly testing what these different shapes are used for. And these new sequencing methods can now quickly give us a phylogeny, which we can use to uh, begin to test. Uh, so not only um, how, what the, how these morphologies are evolving, but how their, their functions and their performance is, is, is evolving. And so when you look at the, the literature, we're already starting to see some little uh, rumblings of this. And um, I wanna give some examples of papers that have inspired me um, in, this, in, this, to, in this goal of trying to understand the link between form and function. Okay, so this, this is a paper by Todd Blackledge et al. And, in this paper, they did a comparative study looking at the functional properties of silk. And, um, and they mapped the, these functional properties onto a phylogeny and you could see the sequential evolution of different, different, uh, different functions evolving um, over time. And so typically our study of web evolution has really looked at web morphology. And this is of course very important but I like this paper because they added a different perspective 
and instead started to ask, what is it that the silk does and what is its perform the performance value of that silk? Um, this is a paper by Medjdin et al. And um, here they looked at uh, scorpion chili, the, the pinchers, and they, they asked how morphology relates to the force that these pinchers can produce. And they found this direct link between the shape of, uh, of these pinchers and the, the force output. And so these studies can show us how the diversity of shapes that we see, how it actually relates to how these organisms are interacting with their environment. And these methods, um, they can, you can use them also to really examine how morphology is used in behavior as well. And so this, this is a in-press paper by Maddie Girard um, et al. And it was a study on peacock spiders and where they examined abdomen morphology, but they did it in the context of looking at what those morphologies are being, how they're being used when the males court, uh, court females um, during, during courtship. And so you can use, you can, you can take morphology, we can look at morphology, not just in the context of function, but in behavior and um, these different performance values, ecology, and really try to understand the purpose of how, of, of how these morphologies are being used. And it's really gonna make our work uh, much more meaningful when we're talking about morphological evolution. And so um, as a final example, I'm gonna start now start talking about my own, my own research. And this was a paper uh, from 2016 where uh, working, looking at the trap jaw spiders, family Mechis Malconiidae, where I'd gone and I'd uh, recorded the, the, I figured out the speed of the chalicerol strikes. And I looked at this on a phylogeny and found that this, this strike speed corresponds with certain morphologies in these spiders. And so now the, these examples that I just showed, um, they're really, they're rare in arachnology and also just in studies of evolutionary biology. And the reason why these studies are so rare is because it's very challenging. It often requires doing lots of little mini studies um, and then combining them at the end and putting them into a phylogenetic context. But um, I think that these, these studies will allow us to tell a more compelling story on arachnid evolution. And so, um, and, and how these different morphologies are evolving relative to their performance outcome. And so this is the take home message um, of my talk that, that um, and for the rest of the talk, I wanna shift and go look more in depth at these, <clears throat> at the trap jaw spiders and talk about how I've tried to make morphology more meaningful by directly examining how that morphology um, is being used. And so let's now switch and start looking at the Mackey's Mountainian spiders. These spiders, um, are, they have a diversity of chalicerol morphologies and functions. And these spiders um, occur only in New Zealand and Southern South America. So I am very jealous of all of you that live in close proximity to these spiders. Um, and Let's see, these spiders, so what, what I've been able to show is that these spiders have highly maneuverable chalicerol movements and they open their chalicery very wide. They have a very wide, they have a wide gate compared to most other spiders. And they have, um, here are their fangs. They have these long hairs that project forward that presumably um, elicit a strike once they come in close contact to their prey. And so these spiders, uh, Mechis malconiids belong, they, they are a palpamanoid. Palpamanoids consist of five families. They're all active hunters and they're mostly, they live mostly in the Southern hemisphere. And most of the other palpamanoid spiders tend, not most, three families of palpamanoids tend to look like other spiders in terms of their carapace and chalicerol shape. But in Mechis malconiids, as well as another relative, um, Archaeids, 
that shape is highly modified. So here's the, the carapace and clissary of an archaeid and a mechis mapaneid. And in these spiders, the carapace is lifted up and formed this tubular shape. And um, internally, the musculature seems to have shifted in orientation. And what this, this structure seems to have done is allowed these two spider families to have highly maneuverable chalicery compared to most other spiders. And um, within the Mechis Malconeids, you have you have interspecific morphological variation as well as functional variation. And so because this morphological variation is there, we can use it to start to test for the link to, to examine how morphology directly relates to function. And so um, my initial my initial work on this group involved recording, recording several about 14 different species, recording their collisceral strikes using a high-speed video camera, figuring out the velocities and speeds, and um, then looking at more their morphologies. And what I found is that these some of the species had extremely rapid collisceral strikes, um, strikes that were so fast, sort of defied belief. Um, and these shown in their, they're the black dots shown on this ancestor reconstruction. And so what you'll notice is these four black dots do not cluster together, but instead they're scattered throughout the phylogeny. And so this is showing that this, this really extremely fast high speed strike has evolved um, independently at least four times. And so these speeds that, that I was recording and seeing were so fast that it was Im implicating this, um, this uh, a mechanism that must be there for slow, for storing energy that and it gets rapidly released. And so in many organisms, particularly the smaller organisms, it is very, it is difficult to produce very fast movements, particularly when you're small. And muscles are also constrained into how fast that they can move. And so um, many organisms have, have evolved creative ways around this. And they do this by evolving elastic energy storage systems that then release energy. And this is very similar to the operation of a bow and arrow where you, you use a muscle, you know, your arm to pull the, the bowstring. And as you do that, you're putting energy in, elastic energy into the bow. And then you release the latch by letting the string go with your fingers. And the arrow then is flung forward. Um, so you, you take all that energy that you slowly store into the bow and you release it instantaneously. And so now this is something that has evolved throughout uh, the tree of life, but it's particularly notable um, in arthropods. And this type of system, again, allows us to really look directly at the link between form and function. And we can start, and that's because what we're seeing is that in, in many of these different organisms that have evolved these structures, we can really go in and start to understand how little minor shifts in morphology can produce major changes in functional performance. And so, in the beginning of my talk, I spoke about how we have these new sequencing methods and how for me, my goal is to start to um, now run these, um, run studies that di directly look at the link between form, form and function. But I'm at the very beginning of doing this. And so far, I've really only been able to focus on this clade from New Zealand which consists of Zearchia and Aotearoa. And so um, I'm gonna present some of my work on these on these, this two sister clades, but I, want, um, but I want you to know that the goal is to then take these methods and use this and apply it across Mechis Malconeids as well as across many of their outgroups and close relatives um, in, in spiders. And so, um, again, the goal of this research is to try to understand what the link is between um, form and function. And I, I had to try, 
I was so overwhelmed with all of these different spider species and their functions that I wanted to really zoom in on just a, a monophyletic group and try to piece together what it was that I was seeing and how and ask the question of how these spiders were capable of moving their callistery in the way that the, in the some with very fast speeds. And so at the time, I knew that uh, Zearchia was one of the fastest known uh, arachnid movements out there. I had a high speed video showing that this uh, lineage has very fast cholesterol strikes. And its closest relative was shown with strong uh, phylid branch support was shown to be Aotea roa. And this lineage, I didn't at the time, I didn't have um, high speed video of this lineage, but the morphology suggested that it was slow. And so um, I wanted to go in and examine, uh, compare these two different lineages because at one time they shared a most recent common ancestor. And so all of the functional differences and morphological differences that we are seeing between them would have evolved since, since the time they shared a most recent common ancestor. And so my goal so far has been to try to understand how spider, how these spiders are operating their chalicery the way that they do. Well, this has opened up a can of worms for me because I've started and I just want to know what these little Mechies Malconeid spiders are doing with their chalicery. But this has proven to be very challenging. And the problem is, is that we lack we currently lack knowledge about just baseline cholesterol function across spiders. And so here I was working with the Mechies Malconeid spiders, which have highly derived morphologies and functions, and I didn't even have a, a baseline context to compare these spiders to, to see what was shifting. So my goal has since become just trying to understand basic cholesterol function in spiders. And this is something that is proven to be very challenging. Um, first of all, the cholesterol have two joints that articulate. They have the fang joint as well as the, the basal cholesterol joint. And they have these, uh, these the, the basal cholesterol, that joint that articulates with the carapace has multiple degrees of freedom. And it has at least nine different muscles that operate it. So this joint is a very, it's a very creative joint that has evolved in, in spiders. And it allows for a lot, it's not a simple joint where it's just one plane of movement. And so to begin to understand cholesterol function and within these two lineages, I started, I recorded these, I, the first step was to look at their performance. And so I, um, what I did is I looked, compared, I used high speed video for Aotearoa and Zearia. With Aotearoa, it was recorded at 1000 frames per second. It's being played back 33 times slower than what you would see in life. And with Zearchia, I was recording up to 100,000 frames per second. And these, this video was being played back 10,000 times slower than what you would see in life. And so the durations and velocities that these two spiders are, um, are achieving is orders of magnitude different from each other. And so again, just to remind you, these are each other's, um, they're, they're sister clades. And so all of this functional difference has evolved since they last shared a most recent common ancestor. And so the next step in this quest of trying to understand cholesterol morphology um, cholesterol function was to begin to examine the morphology. And the first thing that I noticed in the fast, the fast Mechies Malconeid species is they have this really large clipius. And they also have these very thick structures, which I term the clipial ligaments, which, um, and these structures are in the slower species, but they're, they're more reduced. So here's the clipius. And then they just have these sort of foldings where those clipial ligaments are very thick in the, the fast lineage. And so the point of starting to look at this morphology is, try, is to try to figure out what the different morphologies were between these two lineages so that I could then say, okay, maybe this is an important structure in producing these functional differences. 
This is just to show you a, a CT scan uh, looking at how these clipial ligaments look very different in the very fast, the species that produce fast movements versus uh, how reduced they are in the, the slow, the species that produce slow movements. And so the next step then is I wanted to see the internal structures of these spiders. And I did this using uh, computed tomography scans. And this, these, and these methods can allow uh, arachnologists to begin to peer inside uh, very tiny organisms and see the orientation of um, different structures in three-dimensional space. And this, the, this, these images shown right here are just showing you how uh, the CT scanning works. Basically what you do is you put your specimen in the arena and you rotate the specimen. And as you rotate it, you take these, uh, what amounts to x-ray images. And then you can put all of those images together. You make an image stack that you can digitally dissect. Uh, this, this image is of a transverse cut through a cyatholipid spider. Um, so it's not a, a Mechis malconeid, but I like this image because you can see a lot of detail. Here you can even see the, the sarcomeres uh, of these different muscles, which are the, the sort of the building blocks of muscles. And every time I show some of these images to Charles Griswold, he always reminds me how um, he, what he says to me is, wow, Hannah, CT scanning is for you what SEM was for me in the 70s and 80s. And so SEM really revolutionized morphology, where you can now zoom in and look at some very detailed morphology um, up close. And with CT scanning, now we're able to look inside of different structures, uh, inside structures, and see the orientation that these structures all have relative to each other. And I think that this, this me these methods are really gonna transform the study of arachnology. And so you can then go in and you, you go through this process called segmentation where you, you select the regions of interest and you segment them out and you make these three dimensional surfaces. And I did this with the palpamanoid spiders just to try to figure out to develop a hypothesis of homology for these different muscles in the chalicery. And so I needed this uh, again to just get at basic chalicerol function. And my, my starting point was to figure out how these muscles are all homologous to each other so that I could then go in and compare these different muscles in the slow lineage and the fat, you know, in fast lineages. And you can see this is a, a dorsal view looking down at a CT scan. This is the slower Aotearoa. And the, you, there are differences in the muscle architecture, the volume. Uh, the fast lineage has lost several muscles. So these muscles are not in the in Zearchia. And so we can use these methods to compare differences in morphology that directly relate to how, um, to, we can use this to help us figure out how these spiders are capable of ach achieving different functions. And so recently I've become obsessed with muscles and I've, I've been starting to do some use histology techniques to look at muscles. And I think that there was this belief that a lot of these, so I feel like, a, um, a lot of these methods are these sort of traditional methods of studying morphology are being reinvigorated um, with, with sequencing, with CT scanning, um, is only making it obvious how much we need to get back to morphology in a lot of these traditional methods to start truly understanding arachnid biology. And so for me, the study of muscles has been largely overlooked, and this it's this is something across organisms and you know within arachnids as well. And muscles give us the opportunity <clears throat> to see to look at some direct shifts in morphology that directly translate to how spiders are using um, are producing different movements and structures. And <clears throat> excuse me. In, in, in vertebrates, there is a diversity of sarcomere lengths. So sarcomeres are the building blocks of muscles. And these, um, these 
different sarcomere lengths show you whether a muscle produces slow and forceful movements versus fast or not force fat, fast movements that are not forceful. This is a, a histology. This, this is a slice looking at the Xearchaea, the fast species. And you can see there, there are four, at least four different muscle sets in here. And what we can see is that muscles themselves are becoming optimized to either be slow and forceful or fast or producing to produce fast movements. And this is done by looking at the sarcomere length. And so I started to piece all of this information together to try to figure out how it is that these, these what are some methods we can use to, to tell us how uh, these spiders are evolving and producing their different cholesterol strikes. And so, for example, you can look at, what I found was that these muscles color-coded purple have some of the longest sarcomeres, which means they produce slow, forceful movements. And then it's also that they're, um, the volumes, there are differences in volumes and architecture that again suggests that while both of these, these muscles and both lineages are optimized for producing slow and power, uh, forceful movements, in the fast lineage, they're even more optimized. So they're, they're doing their, the muscles are even more optimized. And the same, the same goes for other, other sets of muscles where uh, this muscle that's color coded aqua has some of the shortest sarcomeres. Um, and you can also look at the orientation of the muscle and, and the, the shape of it, see that it's oriented perpendicular to the rest of the muscles. And the muscles, again, are optimized for, so this suggests that these muscles are optimized for fast movement. The muscles are, but they're even more optimized in Xearchaea, where they're getting smaller, the, the muscle fibers are more parallel, and the sarcomere lengths are even closer together. And it's not just, um, just the sarcomere length that's changing, but it's also the composition of the fiber types that's changing in these muscles. So in Aotearoa, you have two different fiber types, some with short sarcomeres and some with long sarcomeres. Whereas in Xearchaea, this same muscle has only one fiber type, which with the short sarcomeres. So again, we're see studying muscles can show us how uh, different structures are being optimized in different ways to produce these functional differences that we see um, in these spiders. And so you can also use these methods to try and understand how the direction of muscle pull. Um, so I tried to orient the chelicerae, how they fit with the carapace. And doing this was just to try to understand how these muscles even operate so that I can begin to understand how evolution is then tweaking these different muscles to produce different functional outcomes. And so doing this, I made these little charts that I could go in and try to figure out these different, uh, the direction of muscle pull um, in these different sets of muscles. And you can build 3D models with, with these CT scans. So I, I built these 3D models. Uh, you can fit, I was able to fit these different three, three dimensional surfaces together. And this really helped me to come up with a hypothesis for how the chelicerae were functioning in these spiders. And here you can see how nicely, how these little, these structures are, they, how they interlock together um, these different sclerites, and you combine that with what we know of the muscles to come up with this hypothesis, which is that what I found when we sort of summarize using all these methods together, seems that these, the muscles colored red um, here are the ones that cause the chelicerae to open up and lift, to lift, lift up and open, to produce these wide gapes, which um, in Xearchaea, I spoke about that, the extended clipeus and those clipeal ligaments. That extended clipeus really offers the space for those chelicerae to roll forward and produce an even wider gape than what we see in the slow lineage. 
And so again, we can use these methods to start to try and understand and piece together how these chelicerae are functioning. And what I suspect is that purple muscle that has the very long sarcomeres is that it's a slow muscle, it's, it's a very forceful muscle. And as it begins to contract in the slow lineage in Aotearoa, it's gonna cause the chelicerae to close. But in the fast lineage, the contraction of that muscle with the wide gape pitches the chelicerae back and creates sort of a latching mechanism. And as those, the, the purple muscles contract, energy is being stored into an elastic structure as the chelicerae are locked open. And so what this has allowed me to do is document how minor, how these minor shifts in morphology can produce these very large functional differences. And so the goal is now to then take these methods and apply these across trap jaw spiders and their relatives and do this in a phylogenetic context. So again, I mentioned I'm, I'm at the very beginning stages of doing this. I've looked so far at only just a handful of lineages, but the goal is to, um, is to try to then understand this in a broad comparative phylogenetic context. And so uh, I'm, I, as, as an aside, just this is the, the end of my talk, but I, I want to just add something that is, um, I found useful in these 3D printed models. I wanna highlight how we can use these models uh, to build sort of proof of concept, um, these models that show proof of concept so this is a model that I built that actually operates. So I was able to test my hypothesis of how the chelicerae are functioning. And you can sort of set the chelicerae in the locked position, and then you can pull what is the, the that muscle uh, to close them. Here it is in slow motion. So you can see that you pull that latch out of the way and the chelicerae sort of roll forward. And what is useful in these studies is that many of the arachnids that we work on are these small little tiny organisms that are very difficult to manipulate. And I, I just want to point out that using these 3D printed models, we can actually um, begin to perform experiments on the models, them, these 3D models themselves. And so what I've been doing, um, I'm, I'm working on using different rubber bands of different uh, elasticity, you know, ha that have different stiffness to try and test exactly how we can tweak performance values in, in these 3D models. And so with that, I will say um, thank you for listening to my talk. And I hope I've conveyed my love of morphology to everyone out there. And I'd be 